China, home to one in five of the planet's population. The superpower the world fears, but few really know. Ken Hom is the godfather of Chinese food. Heaven on earth. He introduced the wok to the West more than 30 years ago. This is the way you should be cooking it. Ching He Huang is leading the next generation of Chinese cooks. I'm just going to chop up the head. With a modern, inventive approach to the cuisine. It's like ducks playing in springtime. Lovely. We're taking a once-in-a-lifetime adventure across China through food. Rabbit head. <laughs> Shall we try one? <laughs> to delve into its heart and soul. I can pull it. Food is the best way to explore Chinese culture because we really live to eat. It's an epic trip, 3,000 miles from the mega cities of the east to the forgotten villages of the Wild West. It's like we've been back to the time of Genghis Khan. <laughs> ah! she, she's just decapitated it. <laughs> we'll uncover the familiar, the secret, and the surprising. Wow, I've never seen that done before. Cook simple and delicious dishes. That is my Sichuan sausage. And reveal the secrets of China, old and new. Oh, yeah. It's like a journey that I've always dreamt about, but in the China I've dreamt about. We're spending the first week of our month-long trip in the capital, Beijing. I was raised in Chicago, and when I first came here in the 1980s, it was just beginning to open up to the West after the dark years of the Cultural Revolution. Unrecognizable. It's like the new frontier. Now everywhere you look, new China smashes up against the old. The question for both of us on this voyage of discovery is to see if all this incredible pace of changes, mm. is that going to affect food, yeah. good and bad. And I'd love to experience modern Chinese cookery here and whether some of the traditions have been eroded. It's a brew that will be quite interesting to see. China is a country of contradictions. Tradition and innovation sit side by side, and it's most evident here in Beijing. In the northeast corner of the country, it has been the imperial capital for 800 years. It remains deeply proud of its traditional culture and cuisine. As it opens up to the world, it's revealing those secrets with a new culinary confidence. We're beginning with the quintessential Chinese food, noodles. They're a humble everyday dish, eaten in all regions. But they have a 4,000 year old history. And today in Beijing, this ancient craft is being celebrated center stage. It's just incredible. I think they got this concept from the West. Yes. Open kitchen, and it's pretty spectacular. It is. I mean, watching them work, it is like an orchestra. Like the guy with the big block that's just shaped noodles, he looks like he's playing the violin. Yes. The capital is pulling in the country's best cooking talents. These noodle masters are from Sanxi province, west of Beijing, where the art of noodle making has been passed down through the generations. They are most famous for their hand pulled noodles. La Mian, made from just wheat flour and water. The skill is in manipulating the dough. You double it up and double again. again. It's really? folding and yes. folding on itself. It's about it be balancing the elasticity before he can actually pull the noodles. So he's stretching now. Now stretching. Okay, he's what he's doing, um, he's, he's pulling, pulling and folding it a little bit like how children used to play cat's cradle. Cat's, cat's cradle is a lot easier. Yeah. <laughs> wow, that's See beautiful. That? That's what we call tang yeah. shou mian. Yes.
They serve 20 different types of noodles here, and these guys are masters of them all. To perfect the technique, every year he would do this for at least two hours a day, for a year and a half. Oh my god. <laughs> This is good. That's good. That is amazing. <laughs> it's like noodle bullets. <laughs> oh, okay. So it's kind of like, get in there. <laughs> I was taught to cook at home by my mother growing up in England. As we travel across China, I'm looking forward to the challenge of cooking in its fiery professional kitchens, where it's rare to find any women. I love it. The drama, the commotion, you know, and also the excitement as you approach, you know, a walk like this, because you never know what's going to happen. This is a very intense heat source here. It's like it heats up the wok to over 350 degrees. It's very powerful. It really keeps you on your toes because one second off and you could burn and destroy the whole dish. Throughout our trip, we'll be cooking dishes simple enough to do at home. First is my take on a classic northern noodle recipe, zha jiang mian. It's the Chinese version of spaghetti bolognese. It's basically a meat topping, a delicious savory meat topping on top of delicious noodles and sometimes you have some uh, fresh crunchy cucumbers. Every region has its own variation of the sauce, but the essentials are minced pork and bean paste. This is belly pork, otherwise Chinese call it hua rou, five layers of heaven. You've got skin, you've got fat, you've got meat, you've got fat again. That's what gives it flavor. And this bit is quite fatty, so I'm not going to use that. Ooh, you can that's use the best that. Bit. Wow, it's really oily, Ken. I don't know, you think so? Maybe a little bit. Just for you. Well, my uncle used to tell me no fat, no flavor. My dish is a classic stir-fry of aubergines with mild green chilies. I've been chefing now for 52 years. I started in my uncle's restaurant when I was 11. My mother sent me there to keep me out of trouble. My first lesson was in mastering the central tool of a Chinese chef. In my uncle's restaurant, there was no such thing as a vegetable peeler. That's all they had was cleavers, so you either had to learn how to use it or you would never get your work done. Unlike the range of knives we have in the West, the cleaver blade does it all, from chopping and shredding to slicing and dicing. Usually what people do with aubergine is they fry it, which I don't really like. So what I do, uh, braising it is very nice. It doesn't get it to be very oily. And I know, Ching, you don't like it greasy and oily either. I've got my wok smoking hot, ready to stir fry my ingredients. I'm putting in some ginger and garlic. Lots of garlic, because I love garlic. Mild chili peppers. Aubergine. Stock, just to braise it. A little bit of soy sauce. The key to wok cooking is controlling the heat. It's a delicate dance between the flame and the wok to control the temperature of the oil. This skill is called wok hei meaning breath of the walk. Next, in go the blanched knife cut noodles. Some spring onions, yep, that's it. A little drizzle of their fragrant chili oil. It cooks for another minute and it's ready to serve. It looks bloody good. I love the look of your dish. You know it's rich, yeah. it's smoky. You can tell it's got all way, the breath of the walk all over yes. it. Yes. <laughs> Now it's my turn at the wok, making my zhajiang mian sauce. Then with the garlic, ginger, leeks, citron pepper in the hot oil, together with the belly pork. And then in with a little bit of wine. A little bit of this tian mian jiang, a sweet bean paste. Tian mian jiang is a key ingredient in Beijing cooking. It's a wheat flour fermented soybean paste with sugar and spices. And a little bit of good stock. 
good quality pork and chicken stock. Keep stirring the ingredients so they don't burn. The sugars in the sauces will caramelize, giving the pork a sweet, crispy edge. This wok burner is so intense, it only takes a couple of minutes to crisp up the pork. Usually, you would need about four. I'm serving it with hand-pulled noodles. Wow. Oh, beautiful. Noodles, once they're cooked, you know, you need to loosen them up a little bit. So I'm going to toss them in the sesame oil and chili oil. And this is not traditional da jiang mian style, but this is my twist on it. Just on the top, I'm putting cucumber, radish, and then with that delicious meat sauce on top, it's got a lot of flavor. And then some of this sort of savory oil on top. And then just some flowers for beauty. Oh, raw vegetables. It gives a nice contrast mm. to the richness of the sauce and the noodles. Bloody good. I <laughs> know. Mm, the aubergine is delicious. It's got that kind barbecue, of barbecue flavor. flavor. It's been tossed well. It's not just the classics of Chinese cuisine like noodles that are being showcased. Street food is also getting a shiny modern makeover. <laughs> Wang Fujing Night Market is bang in the city centre. Traditional food stalls sit alongside luxury hotels and shopping malls. Banana. Mm. I love oh, thank it. Thank you. They used to never speak English. They used to never speak English. Xiao Chi or Small Eats were very much part of the Beijing life for centuries, with vendors on every corner. But as part of the major cleanup for the 2008 Olympics, they were moved off the streets and now operate in regulated and uniform places like this. Now this is oh, this is Zhang Jinbao, Zhang Jinbao. When I think about Beijing, this is exactly what I think about. The bao uh, type of bun. Oh, that's spicy. How much do we owe you? Wow, prices have gone up. Wow, they used to be really cheap here. Ten pi, that's one pound for this. Hey, you're joking. No, it's wow. expensive. It's highway robbery. Despite the prices, this is a great place to get a bite-sized taste of China with food from every region. The Chinese are known for eating everything, especially Cantonese Chinese like me. Oh, uh, no. Now we're talking. Oh, no. No, 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 no. I like a small scorpion. Uh, oh, let's have a cricket, yes. Cricket? Oh. Uh. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Is it meaty right in the middle? It's like not meaty. when you get to their guts. It's like eating a fried uh, piece of crisp. I do love offal and I do love things like chicken's feet and all that. these traditional <laughs> the the you know, duck's tongue, yes. you know. But I can't be really Chinese because I don't eat everything. My stomach dictates who I really am. Yeah. Beneath the modern face of the capital, there are small pockets of the city where it seems little has changed for centuries, and there is still a strong sense of tradition. Jinshan Park is in the shadow of the Forbidden City, the imperial palace that was home to China's emperors for 500 years. Yeah. Every morning before breakfast, people meet for their daily routines. I took classes for a while. <laughs> I thought I was too young for it. <laughs> Maybe I'll get back into it now. For both Ching and I, this trip is deeply personal. We want to understand more about our relationship with our homeland. Even though I was raised in America, 
I've been connected to China through food from a very early age. My father passed away when I was eight months old, and my mother brought me up in Chicago's Chinatown. I grew up in a Chinese bubble because I didn't see any other people except Chinese people. We only ate Chinese food. We went to see Chinese movies, and we only spoke Chinese, Cantonese, that is. The era I grew up was very difficult to be a minority in America. You were either made fun of or you didn't exist. And China was like a dream, like a fantasy. That was a life wrap I clung to, to be proud of my identity. When I finally made it to the homeland in 1983, it was not the China I imagined. It was still emerging from the trauma of the Cultural Revolution of the 1960s and 70s. I was pretty appalled. It was as if China was almost 50 years behind. I just couldn't believe it. In Beijing, traditional food culture was nearly wiped out as a result of Chairman Mao's communist ideals to rid the country of bourgeois influence. Red Guards shut down restaurants and burned recipe books. A lot of chefs left China or else they kept their art secret. In other words, they didn't practice it anymore in public. But, you know, once you cook, you can never forget how to cook. And uh, uh, when the reforms came, all these people came out of their kitchens <laughs> and started cooking again. To see how traditional cooking is being kept alive, Ching and I are headed to a backstreet restaurant in one of the Hutong districts. Old neighborhoods that have survived the city's often brutal modernization. This looks quite dodgy. Are you sure it's here? <laughs> We're meeting a chef who returned to the capital after the reforms. He's been responsible for preserving what I think is Beijing's greatest culinary tradition, Peking duck. I think in my lifetime, I've cooked perhaps 10,000 ducks. 10,000? <laughs> yes. I'd like to see how they make it traditionally. Yeah. Yes. Uh, Ni hao. Ni hao. Ni hao. Ni hao. Ni hao. Chef Zhang Chin has turned his family home of 50 years into this restaurant, which he runs with his daughter. Peking duck is to the Chinese what champagne is to France, and Beijing is its birthplace. It dates back to the Yuan Dynasty of the 13th century when it was reserved exclusively for the emperor's table. Well, the secret of Peking duck is it has to be crispy skin, no fat, and moist meat. And if you don't have that, it's not Peking duck. Chef Li Qin has studied the 700-year-old techniques of the imperial court kitchens. <laughs> <laughs> the first step is most important, to separate the skin from the fat. It can inflate so that when it roasts, the skin can roast separately in this layer of air mm. while the fat melts. And renders. And renders and keeps Keep. the meat moist. Mm. That's the secret of Pekinda. Mm. And how I do it is use a bicycle pump. Mm. So I've always... it's, it's really easy to do and it does it instantly. It's quite a cool thing. But Chef Li Chin is a firm believer that the always are best. Oh, he does it by... Oh, yeah, blowing into blowing it. Blowing wow. into it. <laughs> wow, I've never seen that done yeah. before. Yeah. By mouth. Okay. Yeah. The Peking duck, it's a, a type of Malu duck with the white feathers. The species is important because of the skin. This is why the skin is very important. You can't use any type of duck. It has to be this type of duck that works. It can inflate better, and it's the amount of fat that it has in it. But in a new health-conscious China, there's a growing demand for a less fatty bird. Now over half of the ducks consumed are reared from a super lean breed of Peking chick imported from England. With the entrails removed, Boiling water and sugar syrup are poured over the duck to tighten the skin. It's hung up to dry for four hours, and then it's ready to roast. It feels like parchment paper. It's essential that it's that dry. 
呃，所以考多久呢？师傅？一个小时 ，one hour，one hour。One hour. One hour. Duck over the flame and <laughs> <whoa. laughs> Beautiful, beautiful, isn't it? Oh, it's so beautiful. So, 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 His expertise and knowledge. Mm. This man is passionate. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Chef Li Chin's passion has survived not only the Cultural Revolution. He battled to save his restaurant when the 400-year-old neighborhood was threatened with demolition to make way for new apartment living. Only a third of Beijing's hutongs still exist, and the living conditions here can be pretty primitive. Yeah. What was your Lu experience? It's communal. God, there was no privacy. <laughs> no, no segregation oh my at God. all. Everyone's equal here. Right. <laughs> After an hour of roasting, our duck is ready to eat. Wow. Perfect. I can smell it. Smells and you see so all lovely the and smoky. Steam coming up. Look it at in that the skin. Oh, my mouth is watering like crazy. <laughs> the ritual is familiar to people all over the world. A dab of sweet bean sauce, a couple slices of duck, spring onion, and cucumber, all wrapped in a wafer-thin pancake. Mmm. That is delicious. It's aromatic. It's juicy. The skin is crispy. I've eaten so many Peking ducks all over the world, but this is. The mothership. Thank <laughs> 吃饭都有时候都会成问题。我到了北京，我就认为北京没有艰苦的工作。It's like a human epic. It is. That he's gone through all this hardship to arrive at, and this is our story. And I think he embodies very much what China is about. It's not about complaining. No. It's about looking forward. Yeah. Don't look back. Yeah. We've been in the capital for a couple of days, and we're starting to appreciate the spirit of the Beijingers. Being in the north of the country, Beijing is exposed to some harsh cold winters. Are you warm with a hat on? Okay? Yeah, I'm very warm with a hat on. <laughs> I wish I got one as well. Really? Uh, you have hair. <laughs> I don't. The locals survive it on a diet of hearty comfort food. And we're joining them for a traditional breakfast. Oh, it smells really good. Oh, this is the kind of food I love. Oh, fantastic. I feel like we're at a school wow. cafeteria. You can't come to Beijing without eating a baozi. This, this is the pork and leek one. Yes. Mm. Mm. This is heaven on earth. <laughs> it's so juicy inside. Mm. And the bread is slightly sweet. And the dough has to have that pillowy mm. texture about it. It's steamed. It's like fluffy clouds. It's, it's delicious. Like eating almost sweet nothingness. Mm. Mm. Baozi have savory or sweet fillings and are found across the country as street snacks. In Beijing, there's a unique way of eating them. They serve the baozi with this like an intestine soup, uh, soup like a garlicky, unctuous soup, quite starchy, and inside is some um, intestine, yeah. The locals can't seem to get enough of it, so why not? Mm. 
I've never had baozi, so it's like a Beijing. rich soup like that before. Very Beijing. -y. <laughs> Baozi are part of the extensive dumpling family, pleated parcels of deliciousness that have been at the heart of Chinese cuisine for 600 years. In the capital's high-end restaurants, culinary pride has been taken to levels of fanatical obsession. Kitchens are like factory production lines, producing thousands of dumplings a day to rule book standards. For me, this is never going to compete with the simple pleasure of a home-cooked dumpling. To perfect our techniques, we're going back to dumpling school. It is in Nalu Guoshang, one of the Hutong areas that instead of being bulldozed, are now being protected and regenerated as the government begins to recognize both their cultural and commercial value. But look, look through there, look through there, that's the old style Hutong home. The old courtyard houses are being turned into boutique shops and cafe bars, restoring a sense of community that was central to Hutong life for centuries. Actually, normally I'm quite good at directions, that's a dead end. Yes. Should we just knock on every door? No, no, I don't think so. <laughs> the school teaches traditional home-style cooking to the growing number of Westerners and overseas Chinese moving to China. It's run by Chinese-American food writer Jin Lin Liu, Hi. who came here to reconnect with her roots 12 years ago. Thank you, Jin. The school's dumpling master is a native Beijinger with the intriguing name Chairman Wang. Hello. This is Chairman Wang. I learned how to cook from Chairman Wang. She was my um, cooking teacher when I went to a local cooking school. So we made dumplings a lot, and so that's how we became friends. We're making the classic Beijing dumpling, jiaozi. Traditionally, families make them together for the Chinese New Year. We start with the dough for the dumpling skins. Two parts of flour yes. and one part cold water. You can skip this part and buy ready-made wrappers, but it's great to make your own. And in Chairman Wang's kitchen, there aren't any shortcuts. Wow. Compared to hers, this is not hard enough, actually. Yeah, you basically just want to add more flour in there. Yeah. I'm too afraid to ask her how old she is. No, 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 you never do that. <laughs> you can ask her. <laughs> how old do you think I am? Oh. <laughs> the dough rests for 20 minutes and we start on the filling. Smoked tofu and shiitake mushrooms, finely diced. We're also adding rice noodles, chopped carrot and coriander. Oh, huang jiang. Okay. huang jiang. So she's got here a mixture of uh, yellow bean paste, paste and, and also some tian mian jiang, which yes. is that wheat flour right. paste to bind it together. Tian mian jiang is the sauce used in Peking duck pancakes and is similar to hoisin sauce. We're adding a little dark soy sauce. The light soy sauce actually is saltier. The dark soy sauce adds a little bit more texture and color. Oh, okay, you know, I remember cooking with my grandmother, making dumplings. Mm. It's such a social occasion, actually, but I was too small, mm. you know, to really sort of learn at that such a young age, but I could hear the sound of this chopping, and then her and my great aunts were sitting around, and, mm. you know, they used to all gossip and talk about the neighbour next yes. door, and <laughs> <laughs> it's wonderful. I mean, with all this modernization going on, especially here in Beijing, to what extent is this still being done in homes? It is being done at home still, but less and less, I'd say, time-consuming, especially if you want to do them right. You make everything from scratch. Now it's on to the dumpling skins. The hollow bit in your palm in the center makes that mound, that shape. So it's kind of fat in the middle and then kind of sloping on the sides. The rolling pin never leaves the board. You're just doing this repetitive motion with this hand mm. and turning with the other hand. Mm. To judge whether you've made a really good dumpling skin, you know, in the imperial courts, if you made the skin really, really thin that you could still read a newspaper behind it, then you knew you had the perfect thinness of skin. <laughs> <laughs> Next, we fill and seal the dumplings. 
At Chinese New Year, it's the tradition to hide coins inside, and the one who finds them is blessed with good fortune. This is the easy way. Just it's press, seal it. You want a smooth circle on one side, and then the pleats on the other side. And a good dumpling is one that sits down and doesn't tip mm -hmm. over. We're cooking the dumplings two ways. The first is simply boiling for 15 minutes. The second is pan seared, my favorite. This is great. This is great steam in the water. And you close the steam. It's crispy on the bottom. And it cooks with the steam. So you want to fill the water about two thirds of the way to the dumpling top. Right. To get a delicious crispy bottom on your dumpling, add a ladle of oil. Leek uh, ginger, uh, ginger, 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 Sichuan peppercorn. Mm. Fragrant mm. oil. Fragrant. Wow. 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 Beautiful. Wow. That looks so good. <laughs> you don't understand what that means to me right yeah. there, looking at it. <laughs> it's like home. It's like home. That's oh. sweet. Yeah. If the dumpling skin is too thick, it's too chewy. If it's too thin, the dumpling will break. These look spot on. Oh, the classic way to eat dumplings in the north is dipped in wheat flour vinegar and chili oil. And actually, Beijing is also like raw pieces of garlic. Garlic, garlic yeah. Don't yeah. munch on those. Do you guys want some of that? I don't plan to kiss anyone tonight. Might <laughs> <laughs> as well. Wow. I can taste the mm, sweetness taste of the, the carrot, you can taste the texture of that smoked tofu. Mm. So delicate and moist. Sensational. <laughs> mm. Mm. This is masterful. Hands down, she's dumpling master <laughs> of no, no, Beijing. Baby. Cooking with Chairman Wang's brought back memories of being in the kitchen of my grandmother's farm in Taiwan, where I spent my early childhood. She passed on three years ago, and I've come to a Buddhist temple to pay my respects to her. Well, my grandparents looked after me from when I was a very young age, from about two. Both my parents were really busy working, trying to uh, make a living. My memories of food actually all come from those very early years of living on that farm. We didn't have very much, but every day was so much fun. The island of Taiwan is off the south coast of China and is disputed territory. My parents left for work when I was five, and we traveled first to South Africa, then England, where we settled when I was 11. When I was growing up, I didn't want to be Chinese. I wanted to be English. I wanted to be everything that was not Chinese. And my father forced me to go to Chinese school every Sunday, and I had to cook Chinese food for my dad. And I actually resented that, and I hated cooking. And um, But only as the years have gone by that actually that's the only Chinese part of me that, that remained was the cooking bit and the food. Through it, I now appreciate Chinese culture and I'm finding myself through food. I'm beginning to understand more of where I'm from and who I am. This journey is so important because it gives me a chance to really delve deeper into Chinese cooking uh, and just to learn more. As Western as I am Chinese, it's pretty challenging cooking authentic food for people in their homes, especially in some of the most traditional places outside of the cities. Yeah, I want to see what people are eating, what are they farming, to see what you know ordinary life is, if there's such a thing as ordinary life in China anymore, because it's so developed. In the last 20 years, over 100 million people have left their villages to find work in the mega cities springing up all over China. But it's strange, isn't it? Because you've got deserted towns dotted around. There's no life. It's like a like ghost town. I'm traveling two hours out of Beijing, 
90 kilometers to the west is Chuan Disha. Chuan Disha is a 400-year-old village. It used to be a thriving farming community. Now only a hundred villages remain. I'm staying with Mr. and Mrs. Han, whose family have lived here for generations. Oh no, I I thought it was just three generations, but he says 13 generations. The Hans run a homestay. These are like B&Bs that offer a taste of rural peasant life that's fast disappearing. They're popular with the new urban middle classes who want to escape the city and experience a China of the past. So this is a Zihayuan, it's a courtyard home, and it all belongs to his family. This is wonderful. I feel like I really have stepped back in time. Central to the homestay experience is the home-cooked meal with homegrown vegetables. I'm hoping to learn some traditional country recipes from Mrs. Han. She's going to teach me how to make cornmeal pancakes. Cornmeal pancakes are the equivalent of their daily bread. When I don't understand something because my Chinese isn't great, she tends to raise her voice. She's a real character. I'm actually quite scared to cook in the kitchen. Oh, well, well, so this is basically, let me just finish explaining this. This is corn. Oh, she said, don't open it. <laughs> <laughs> she said, don't be in such a hurry. Anyway. Mrs. Han seems a little nervous of strangers in her kitchen, but I persuade her to let me share the walking under strict supervision. So this is slices of pork. <laughs> We're making a stir-fry of pork and wild mushrooms. You've got vegetable oil, you've got some citron flower pepper, you've got some ginger, and you explode it in the wok. We call it Bao Xiang, explode fragrance. And she's added slices of pork. In the summer, they pick mushrooms from the mountains and freeze them for winter months when fresh food is scarce. Wow. Oh, she said, don't worry about the look of it, it is really good. Stir fry that together. A good substitute would be oyster or chestnut mushrooms. And then she's added a little bit of dark soy sauce for colour, to colour the meat. And she's also put a little bit of garlic, a uh, bit more spring onion at the end. Just okay. Looks mean and moody. <laughs> Mrs. Han's an expert in making a little go a long way. She's using the leaves of a pepper plant to make a kind of tempura. Oh, this is the uh, Huajiao Sichuan pepper leaves. She's put it in egg and wheat flour and she's deep frying it. This would work equally well with spinach or kale. Wonderful, isn't it? Before we eat, Mr. Han prepares my sleeping accommodation for the night. It's so basically a wood fire under your bed, and the heat from that will just warm the bed. Works like electric blanket, but old school style. Mrs. Han made with that delicious um, mushroom. Pork and mushroom. Mmm. Whilst the homestay gives the hands a small income of around 4,000 pounds a year, 
Above all, they seem proud to share their traditional way of life with their guests. I think this this like many villages across the country, Shuangdi Xia has seen most of the younger generation up sticks. 30 years ago, just one in five people lived in urban areas. Now, half of the country's population are city dwellers. It's been the biggest migration in history. Beijing is now home to 20 million. It sprawls for over 10 times the size of London with densely packed suburbs. I'm meeting up with my friend and food writer, Hong Ying, a country girl who now lives in the chic district of Chao Yang Park. This is her local market, where we're shopping for dinner. The variety yes. I find astonishing. This is from, uh, from America. America, Boston. This is uh, Canada. It's an interesting mix of Western imports. Oh, yes. oh look what they have here. Oh, yes. Brussels sprout. <laughs> and Chinese favorites, eels, Pig trotters and cows' hooves. Oh, what's that? That's, uh... Oh, this is a flower. Yes, uh, very, very delicious. Oh, it's called cucumber flower. I've yes. never even seen it. Yes. I'm, I'm, really? going I, I... I'm thinking about these yeah. chicken wings. Yeah, I like chicken very much. Honging's life has changed dramatically since her childhood during the Cultural Revolution. In the countryside, there were severe food shortages and families were rationed. When you were growing up, it was very hard to get meat. How old were you before you taste your first chicken? Um, I think maybe near 12. 12? Wow. Yeah. Every morning when the sky is still very mm. dark, we have to use the non kill. Yeah. We don't have no. enough food. Right. So many people mm. died from hungry. The Great Famine in the late 50s and early 60s took the lives of an estimated 30 million when Chairman Mao's agricultural reforms failed. In Sichuan, where Hong Ying lived, one in seven died. The first yes. time I saw the marketing like this, I think it's so rich and so many uh, color. I really touched on the cry. When China opened up, Hong Ying moved abroad and became a successful food and fiction writer. She returned to Beijing 10 years ago. You can say that Beijing is really changed, just like some vegetable grew up. For dinner, we're cooking two dishes, starting with the chicken wings. Now, what I'm making here yeah. is just uh, your sea salt yes. and five spice powder. I think five spice is a great seasoning. Just put it over the chicken yes. wing. It comes ready mixed and is a blend of cinnamon, cloves, star anise, fennel, and Sichuan peppercorn and then throw it in the oven. That's how simple it is. The chicken needs to bake for 30 minutes. To go with it, I'm making a side dish from the staple of Beijing cooking, cabbage, which saw people through the hard times. I think cabbage is a homage to Beijing. I'm going to stir fry it with this lovely dried shrimp. I could smell it when I took it out, how, yeah. how good this was. Into the wok goes some garlic, then the shrimp and the cabbage. It's the smell of real Chinese cooking, huh? No, I usually add rice wine, but with none at hand, I'm winging it. Can I add a little bit of the gin? <laughs> uh, <laughs> a little bit. Too much. Yeah, it's too much. <laughs> <laughs> that smells good. I'm blanching the cucumber flowers we bought in the market for a couple of minutes. Tastes like bean. Then I give them a minute in the walk. Very good. I've never okay, used that lifted. before. Hong Ying started cooking at 11 in the village commune kitchen. Each family was rationed just two kilos of rice a month. She learned to make the most out of very little. Hong Ying, how did you turn what happened to you into a love of food? I think the food, just like writing and painting. If you feel that, and you just concentrate and put your heart and the emotion and your love, and the, the, the things just so, change. Very philosophical. <laughs> <laughs> After half an hour in the oven, 
The chicken wings are golden brown and crispy. I'm finishing them off in the wok with garlic and spring onions. When you cook it like more than once, you have different layers of flavor. Remember, Chinese cooking is about layers. It's not just one dimensional. It's really delicious, just like my mother made it. <laughs> really. You must try the cabbage. Okay. Mm, <laughs> wonderful, very hmm? soft. Yeah. I learned something from you today. Jin. Mm -hmm. Golden Jin. I was impressed. <laughs> 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 In Chuandi Sha village, I'm up early to join my homestay host, Mrs. Han, making our country breakfast. It's Tong Dan Bing, spring onion flatbread. My mother taught me how to make them, but I'm pretty sure Mrs. Han has her own particular way of doing it. The way I was taught is you put a layer of um, spring onion oil, then you fold it, almost like a pastry. Huh? Oh, wow, she's making it. A different way. <laughs> she cuts it like a cake and then she folds it back on itself mm. in like a clockwise direction and then she kneads it again. Quite a good technique actually. It means it has this stretchy kind of layers. Yeah. So you have to cook it until the dough is cooked through. Uh, normally, <laughs> we have you know, a thin layer of um, egg, beaten egg, like a crepe that we put on top and we roll it. That's how I'm used to eating it. But she's going to be serving it with boiled eggs. Now, that's something new. I haven't tried it with boiled eggs before. I'm going to risk rocking the boat here and make my crepe version too. It's really simple, just eggs, salt and spring onion. With the wok on a medium heat, add the beaten egg mixture, swirl it around so it coats the wok and creates a thin egg crepe. Once it's cooked on one side, flip it over and cook the other side. This is how we'd have it normally in Taiwan. Like that. Tong Yo Bing with an egg, like that. And this is what how we would serve it in Taiwan. Finally. Now we can eat. To accompany our two different versions of the flatbreads, Mrs. Han has also made corn porridge. Because we're in the north of China, they don't really grow rice here. So instead they have sweet corn porridge. You know, it's got a wonderful smoky flavour to this. It's really delicious. Mm. <laughs> Thank God. She said everyone has their own way of cooking and their own style. It's our final night in Beijing. We're back in the heart of the modern city and its most exclusive street where the new rich come to shop and eat. We're cooking with a chef who is leading the capital's food revolution. Chef Da Dong brings tradition and innovation together in culinary theater. And his specialty is, of course, the nation's favorite, duck. <laughs> this proud Beijinger became a chef on his father's advice that he'd never go hungry. 
He's dedicated himself to reviving the reputation of Chinese cuisine after it was blighted by years of oppression and poverty. This is the big difference. Chefs before in China only knew about their region. Actually, they never had the opportunity or the time or the money to travel anywhere else. This is one of his signature dishes, sweet and sour duck balls in a crispy yam basket. <laughs> this is not like sweet and sour you ever seen anywhere. It's like the duck has given birth to the duck balls, and that's the duck eggs. It's all very poetic. <laughs> Inspired by this beautiful creation, we're now cooking for him, making our Dadong style dishes using his delicious Peking duck. We will show him. <laughs> yeah, the Cantonese and the Taiwanese can yeah, take on a Beijing. I'm doing a twice cooked crispy duck and apple salad. I'm inspired by the flavor of the fruit yes. wood. You know, they use the apple trees, yes. the you know, pear trees. This is like the way that they slice and carve their duck. So I thought maybe we'll do some apples, you know, little pieces. Oh, beautiful. This is like kind of like kind of carving a duck. Now for the duck. The leg meat is more juicier, more succulent. And because I'm going to fry it again, I need that juicy, meaty part. And then just going to chop it into bite-sized pieces. It's rough. Rough is OK, even with the skin. I'm just going to put a little bit of five spice. Just a little bit. It really does really help to bring out the flavor of meat. And then cornstarch, and then we're ready to deep fry. The duck only needs a minute in the wok. As it's already cooked, I'm just sealing in the flavor. Because the oil is hot, the outer edges where it's caught the corn flour, like this. Lovely golden and crisp. Just train the excess fat. Next is the salad dressing. I'm using EXO sauce, a spicy seafood sauce made from dried shrimp, dried scallop, and chilies. And then I'm going to use some of this tianmian jiang, this sort of sweet bean paste. A little bit of sugar, a little bit of black rice vinegar. It can be sweet and sour. Right. How's the sauce? It's okay. It's a little bit too vinegary. I think I need more of the sweet bean paste and a little bit more sugar. Okay. If it's too vinegary, you just add a little bit more sugar. So a little spicy sweet. Lovely. Like that. So that's like ducks playing in the springtime. <laughs> My dish is minced duck with lettuce cups. I'm going to stir fry the Peking duck with radish and cucumber, along with some fresh water chestnuts. I want to get this really, really hot. Okay, some ginger, garlic, spring onions. I'm ready to walk and roll here. Yeah. I'm going to add my duck and all these condiments he uses for his uh, picking nuts. So this is a bit of a homage to him as well. That looks good. I love the colors, uh, the pink and the green. A little bit of rice wine, water chestnuts, and I, what I like is a little bit of peanuts for crunch. I'm also using the sweet bean sauce and adding a touch of my favorite oyster sauce. That'll be ready. I love watching Ken with a wok. The way he works it with the flame, he's infusing the ingredients with a deep, smoky flavor. Uh, good wok, hey. Finish it off. You'll have a bit of crunchiness. Yeah. 
little bit of texture. Flavor. You only need a yeah. little bit. Finally, I'm using the fattiest part of the duck, the skin, to add extra crouton like crunch to my dish. Like the crackling. The oh, crackling of the duck. So that's going to have that crunch. And I couldn't resist stealing a bit of his edible flowers. <laughs> Beautiful. Do you think we're going to be able to impress that dog? Ah, uh, it takes a lot to impress him. <laughs> I've cooked for 52 years, but right now, I feel like I'm back in school. Oh, and now for mine. To end our time in Beijing, Da Dong has made us a feast of duck delicacies. It's a homage to the grand imperial court banquets of China's past. Salted duck livers, braised duck tongues, and stir-fried duck hearts. Oh my goodness, that is rich. Feels good in your mouth. In Cantonese, you call it ho song. You know, it's like... Uh, yeah, yeah, it's like... Mm. China, even 30 years ago, uh, this dish is just a big pot, and it's a good taste. So, 30 years ago, it's just a big pot, it's just a big pot. 那么现在呢,除了好意,我们要尝各种的味道,还有就是让菜更漂亮,更艺术。I'm so surprised and so touched that I see this in my lifetime. When I used to come to China, I thought, oh my god, we're so behind. Uh, is it ever going to catch up? And now I see people like Datong mm. and I'm sure I'm going to see many places in China how it's changing and it makes me proud it's a full circle uh, coming to terms with who I am and um, I was right to be proud <laughs> to be Chinese <laughs> yes, <that's Yeah>. nice. <laughs> this is fantastic next time we journey to the Sichuan province the spicy heartland of China. Wow. It's really yeah. numbing heat. Where oh. the food is fiery and the chili pepper is king. This is actually blow your head off good. We'll explore one of the world's fastest growing mega cities. I thought it would be a lot of change, but it's shocking. But it's still deeply Chinese. Oh, he's massaging your ears. I love it. <laughs> we'll venture into the rural backwaters to cook traditional dishes. This pixie is really good. Cartilagey. But good. And find out why Sichuan cuisine is now being celebrated around the world. I'm discovering things here that are an inspiration to me. And seeing a very different side to China next on BBC Two, an enchanting glimpse of wild China's spectacular scenery and wildlife.